Hello and welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us uh, today. My name is John Gomez. I'm the CEO and founder of Sensato. Um, we're going to spend just a couple minutes. We have a lot of new people who have registered for this program. So just going to tell them, tell you a little bit about Sensato, but um, please, you know, um, just stand by that we, we, we're not here to do a marketing or sales event. We'll get into the content uh, as quickly as we can. Um, with that, just so everybody knows, if you haven't interacted with us before, we're a little bit different in terms of how we look at security. And um, sometimes some of the things we say may not be part of the status quo. So just want to kind of put that out there and prepare you for, uh, for some of the things we share with you in this event. This series itself is a six-part series. Uh, we're now in the second um, session of this series or second episode, I suppose. You are, uh, by being registered, you can access the videos of our prior sessions um, and any of the future sessions we do um, in the event that you can't actually make a session as we do these. Um, <clears throat> hopefully you found, if you did attend the first session, uh, eye-opening and uh, stimulating. And that's really the, the goal here is to kind of help you think about what if this occurred in your environment, what could you do to defend against it? We'll talk a little more about that in a few moments. Um, <clears throat> but the thesis behind this program itself um, is really um, the defender's viewpoint. Um, we're really trying hard um, to kind of overcome in the industry, if you will, this viewpoint of many defenders have, many blue team members, many CISOs and cybersecurity analysts where We've been seeing, you know, well, if I don't see it in my logs, it's not happening. If I don't see an alert, uh, it's not, you know, it's not real. Uh, or how could somebody ever do that? Or how would they ever, you know, how would this ever happen? Or, you know, basically, if I can rationalize it uh, in some way, shape, or form, then it isn't really a security issue. Um, and so we're trying through these programs to maybe hopefully open people's eyes to the attacker's perspective. Um, we find that a lot of times when we interact with uh, defenders, they really understand or employ the attacker's perspective. They, they kind of fall back to this position of being a defender. And um, the viewpoint of the attacker is very, very different. And I think this session, this episode, will probably highlight that more than maybe some of the other ones we've done or some of the ones we even will do. Um, and one of the big things I think that makes attackers different uh, is their audacity, right, is that, um, <clears throat> you know, they don't have the same rules. And we kind of say that, and we all know that, I'm sure. But um, we try to rationalize their audacity as defenders. Uh, sometimes because we're on the defense side of security, um, it's more comfortable for us to think that certain things can't happen or certain people wouldn't do things. And therefore, um, it's it's maybe, an, it's not so much um, so security, uh, security by obfuscation, sorry, I messed up that word, uh, but really kind of creates this false sense of security. Um, and we kind of then inject our own limitations on the attacker. If we can't imagine it, if we can't understand how that would happen, if we can't understand how that would be done, um, we then assume that the attackers couldn't do that. And unfortunately, I think a lot of times we don't really really spend enough time in the shoes of an attacker. I want to spend a couple seconds on this session just talking about that word attacker. We use the word attacker a lot. We've tried very hard since we started the company in 2013 um, to not use the word hacker. And we work with organizations, individuals, we try to retrain their brain, if you will, to stop calling people hackers. Um, you know, I use this example with one of my team members this morning. If somebody came up to you on the corner and asked you for your credit card and your <clears throat> your uh, driver's license and social security card and health information insurance card, um, you know, and you handed that stuff over at gunpoint, um, or even if they didn't have a gun, they just slammed you up against the wall and told you to give that information to them. When hopefully they run away and leave you alone. But when you get on the phone and dial 911, I doubt you're going to say, hey, I've been hacked. Somebody just took my driver's license and my credit cards and all the stuff in my wallet. You're probably going to tell them that you got attacked. And the reality is it's the same thing that occurs in the digital world. Right, we're being attacked and the people that come after us are attackers and their mindset and what they do is vastly different than a hacker. And so if you're a certified ethical hacker or you're a white hat hacker, which I've never understood what a white hacker hat hacker is um, or why we even categorize people like that. Um, you know, the reality is you still live within a world of rules and ethics. And so, you know, when we recognize a hacker, you know, maybe that's cool for pen testing, kind of, sort of. Um, but ultimately, we're being attacked. And as a defender, that's what we need to really kind of first and foremost understand. And this series, I think, hopefully will tease a lot of that out. 
Um, for you as an attendee, some of the things we're hoping that you'll do as you take these sessions and go through them is do some just-in-time auditing. Um, you know, question amongst yourselves, some of you are attending as a group of people, some individually, but all of you are representing um, an organization in critical infrastructure. Many of you are in the healthcare space. Um, so, you know, some of you are with government agencies, some of you are with the defense, uh, but ultimately all of you represent critical infrastructure. So this is a great way as we go through these to think about what if this did actually happen here? Uh, don't fall back on the defender's side of it and the rationalization of, well, you know, that wouldn't happen here because of this, or that would never occur, or how would you even do that? I think that's, a, again, you're falling back to your defender's limited view of the world. Um, <clears throat> This is also a great program to evolve your blue team skills. A lot of what we do here, you could just take and use as a tabletop um, straight out of the box, just using kind of the, uh, the scenarios that we're gonna put forward. So um, <clears throat> think about that. Um, and then, you know, kind of think about how else what we present could be accomplished. Um, you know, there are a variety of different ways to do the things we talk about. And so maybe there's things we don't know, we don't understand, and you may have insights into how you could pull off that attack. And if so, feel free to share it with us or use it within your organization to kind of foster that creativity. So with that, <clears throat> a little bit about us, we've not covered this before. We do have our own cybersecurity platform. It is fully monitored, easy to deploy. It's, it's pretty cool, we think. We obviously were the parents of it. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because a lot of the information we're gonna be sharing with you today in this episode comes from some of the things we've seen uh, occur uh, in different ways, never to the extreme that we're gonna go into today. Um, and most of that comes from our Cybersecurity Tactical Operations Center, which is a, is a SOC, but it's much more than a SOC. It's really focused on the protection of life as well as the protection of data. And we'll talk a little more about what we mean by that in a moment. Um, many of you may not know that we are an ISAO. Um, so we, we do um, gather intelligence and do some other activities related to our mission as an ISAO, especially in the critical infrastructure space. And we also have a memorandum of understanding with the FDA where we share threat intelligence with them and and sometimes we'll work with them on <clears throat> analyzing and reviewing potential threats uh, or attacks against medical device infrastructure here in the US. Um, so the reason I bring that kind of stuff up is, um, aside from the fact that we're very proud of those things and the work we do with those organizations, is that uh, some of the things we're gonna talk about today come from uh, some of the information and work we've done in those spaces. Uh, not all of it, but some of it. So wanna talk a little bit about <clears throat> um, responding to threats. And um, the reason we want to do this is because ultimately, um, as you go through this today, think about how you would respond to what we talk about today. Um, and there's some lessons learned. Some of you may not know this, but we've had well over probably about six, 700 people attend our tabletop uh, programs, well over a thousand institutions, or uh, sorry, over a thousand people in 600 institutions. I would get that mixed up. Uh, and there's some things we've taken away from those, some things that we see over and over and over when it comes to incident response. And the scenarios that we talk about today, the tactics that we employ today, ultimately the difference between life and death will come down to how you respond to an incident. Uh, obviously you need to detect the incidents, so that is a key part of it, but once you detect them, how do you respond? And one of the things, uh, some of the things we've seen when it comes to incident response, like I said, when we do tabletops for people, um, is that typically when you have a, a high stress, high velocity incident, um, it the response breaks down and usually very quickly, right? We see typically people come into the tabletops with their laptops and their tablets and their incident response plans printed out just in case we tell them their systems are down and they're ready to go. And they've spent a lot of time developing these incident response plans. But what we find is as soon as we start going into the injections and those injections pick up momentum, the plans get abandoned and people fall back on ad hoc kind of practices, which is not a good thing, right? You wanna respond from a muscle memory perspective. Um, most of the plans we see and most of the incident response organizations we work with do not think about the emotional or psychological impact of the responder or the rest of the organization. And in healthcare, this is really, really important because if you ever go look at the Vanderbilt study, you will find that any significant cyber breach has an impact on patient mortality, not just patient safety, but actual patient outcomes. So if your incident response plans really aren't that effective uh, in responding to high velocity, high violence attacks, then you're probably impacting patient outcomes. So just something else to know. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've talked about attack audacity, so I'm not gonna go into that, but simply to recognize most IR plans or people responding in an incident don't really think through the attacker's audacity. And that's a challenge in and of itself, and it limits the response. 
Uh, and the last piece of this is most programs, most incident response programs we see are very hierarchical, um, right? So you, you get information, you see an alert, something comes into the help desk, something comes in through another channel, that person who's closest to the incident on the ground now has to escalate and get permission from someone else. They may need to get permission from someone else. Um, there may be second guessing, somebody wants to review the logs or whatever it is, but you have this hierarchical approach to incident response. Uh, as we go through the scenarios today, what you need to think about is, well, if we have a hierarchical approach in our incident response and this happened here, would we really be able to stop this, right? Would we respond fast enough? Would we be able to get this under control, assuming you detected it to begin with? Uh, and some of the things we do today, you probably may not be able to detect, but maybe it will. Um, and if you did, how could you respond? Has the organization really revamped their approach to incident response and is it more tactical or is it more classical where really we have these kind of playbooks that are really extreme and have all these flow charts and we think that's what we're going to do when 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 things go wrong and then we abandon them and then we're kind of stuck with not really having any real muscle memory on how we respond. On top of all that, especially because of the conversation we're going to be having today or the presentation today, the other thing I'd like to, to kind of illustrate is that <clears throat> cybersecurity in today's world, and for as long as I can remember, um, is data centric. And some of you may be thinking, well, yeah, duh. Um, but there's an issue with that, right? And the issue with that is simply that for most of us on, on this presentation for today, most of you that are, are viewing this and will view this in the future, your primary job is not to protect data. Now, I know some of you are going to be like, what? What are you talking about? The reality of life is if you're in a healthcare organization and many of us that are in critical infrastructure security, your primary job is to protect human life. But one of the things that kind of hit me about a year and a half, two years ago is, huh, it's kind of interesting that there is no framework, no regulatory framework, at least that I know of, that is really focused on protecting human life. And all of us really are really good at protecting data, or we try to be good at protecting data. And our viewpoint is typically that an attacker is going to go after data. Right? If we think of things like HIPAA or PCI or whatever, uh, NIST 853, NIST CSF, high trust, these things are designed to protect data. Right, And the moment we cross that chasm from the mission objective of the attacker is not to go after your data, but is to go after the patient or to go after the end user or to go after the uh, passengers in a plane, um, <clears throat> things start to fall apart. And if you start thinking about what I just said regarding incident response, and how those plans kind of fall apart when we're just trying to run simulations related to data breaches. What happens when we have in a situation where we have an attack against a human life? And that's really the focus of the attack. It's not a collateral situation, but even if it were collateral, right? So I think it's important to step back that as an industry, and I don't care if you're in the healthcare space, if you're defense, uh, if you're you know, with, with the airline industry, transportation, whatever sector you represent, chances are you do not have a codified framework or a set of best practices that really focus on how to protect human life from a cyber attack. And so just something to gnaw on and chew on. Uh, and as you go through this today, hopefully you think about that and find ways to, to address that, right? I wouldn't wait for something to get developed. I would say that it's behooven to all of us as defenders to go figure out how do we get better at protecting life. Uh, it does change your, your, your perspective, right? If I tell you in your job description that your number one job is to assure that no harm comes to a patient via a cyber attack, your reality and your priorities probably will change versus me telling you that your most important thing is to assure nobody gets the patient data. Um, so just something to, to kind of think about and dwell on as you go through your day. So a little bit of a spoiler alert here because when this <clears throat> when we publish these series and put this out there that we're gonna be doing a session on breaching life support systems, I actually did get two calls, um, but from people I know that are part of some different agencies. And they were like, you're not really going to show people how to do this, are you? Like, are you going to actually go through how to carry this out? Um, and so the spoiler here is like, no, I'm not going to get into the actual mechanics of an attack to de defeat a breach, uh, a life support system. But um, I will probably give you enough information that you on your own could figure out what to do or how this happens. My, my goal here ultimately uh, is to get you as a defender to think about what if this occurred here? How would we detect it and how would we respond to it? And that's it. Not so much, okay, here's the exact code that I would use. And if some of you are really, really interested in that, I don't know, maybe reach out to me and maybe we can have that conversation. The second thing I will tell you is uh, I presented all of this back in 2000, 
13 maybe, 14, something like that uh, at DEF CON. Uh, so this has been updated since then, uh, but this has been out there and I don't think I'm breaking any ground here in terms of what's possible. Um, maybe, maybe I'm adding a few things to it, but ultimately the spoiler alert here is no, we're not going to actually uh, take you through the code that, that's required to do this, but um, we'll, we'll be short just of that. Uh, the other thing is this could be very disturbing to some to you. Uh, I kind of mentioned already, we're a little bit different and I don't think you can be a defender in the critical infrastructure sector, um, especially with those sectors that represent uh, or protect or, or are responsible for maintaining human life um, and not just have a frank discussion, right? We can't go from one slide that says, hey, we really don't do have any frameworks or best practices related to defending people from cyber attacks to, okay, let's be really politically correct about our scenario so nobody gets upset. Some of you may get upset. Some of you may see what we're about to do and this isn't for you. And um, I'm not sure what to do for you on that. Um, it's the space we're in. And either we have frank and honest dialogue about these things um, or we don't. And all of us have loved ones, right? People we care about, including ourselves, that eventually will require us to trust the very infrastructure that each of us are responsible for protecting. Um, so this is a pretty serious topic. So I guess I kind of sort of maybe not apologize if you're upset that some of these things we talk about. Um, but ultimately, the, the, my goal here is to helpfully evolve everybody's skill sets as best I can. Uh, and there's a lot of things I don't know, so I don't know if, how well I'll do that or not. Um, so with that, let's jump into this. <clears throat> uh, for those of you that attended the first session or first episode, you'll remember that we kind of created this fictitious company, or sorry, country, um, called uh, the Republic of Pineland. And we were part of a different country. Or, um, we were going to attack uh, another country's infrastructure, IT infrastructure, um, because um, th this country was potentially uh, looking to invade our country. So we're going to use cyber as a way to hopefully fend them off. Um, so within this episode here, we're going to continue along that track. And if you want all the details to what I just talked about, please refer back to the first episode. I don't want to rehash all that and, and take up people's time that has gone through that. But the idea here is we are <clears throat> basically part of a mission unit um, known as Op Center, and our job is to carry out uh, offensive computing um, for our government, right? And so we have a pretty good amount of resources. Um, what I will tell you is none of the attacks that we do in the prior episode, this episode, or future episodes actually require a lot of sophistication. Uh, so even though we're representing ourselves as being part of some uh, offensive computing group, we don't need to have the most impressive skill set to do the things that we will walk through. Um, and I did that on purpose because I don't want people coming back and saying, well, what are the chances of that happening? Or you'd have to be in the top 1% of attackers to pedal that off and those kind of things. So everything we're doing here kind of fits in nicely with the fact that most attacks in this day and age, including ransomware, um, utilize low tech approaches. They're not very sophisticated. We're not seeing a lot of polymorphic genetic algorithms out there running around causing havoc for everybody. It's pretty straightforward stuff. So we'll focus on that as, as we carry this out. So our, our mission task today uh, as a unit is um, <clears throat> simply to disrupt medical systems connected to a person by the name of Serial Nasdio. Uh, as far as I know, there is no such person named that way so uh, that I know of. If there is, then um, yeah, sorry. Uh, Serial is the father of the Prime, Prime Minister of Atlantica, which is our our foe in this situation, it's the other country. Um, and Cyril has been recently uh, admitted to the hospital. He's in the coronary care intensive care unit of the uh, Pineland University Hospital. So um, we're going to, um, to um, <clears throat> try to figure out, is there a way for us to, to get to Cyril? Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some assumptions, right? And uh, we are picking up where we left off of in the last episode, which was uh, we talked about breaching firewalls, VPN systems, and potentially other types of systems uh, and gaining access undetected or masking our operations such that we can get a foothold within an organization. Um, so we've, we're assuming we've breached the environment at this point and we are inside of the hospital environment in this case uh, and, and have the ability to be there. Uh, our goal is to remain undetected, uh, but we have established command and control within the environment. Uh, some of you may be wondering, well, how can you establish command and control and not, not be detected? Um, part of that we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, um, not directly, but tangentially, the idea is if you're going to establish command and control, 
and you want to remain undetected, there are a few things that you do as an attacker. One, um, don't use anything that comes up in an IOC list, right? And uh, how hard is that to do? Well, I don't know, IOC lists are pretty public, so we can subscribe to them as attackers just like you can as defenders. In fact, I can set up a shell company and buy the same threat intelligence that you do. Um, I can go to VeriSign and others and get threat intelligence feeds, right? So it's not that hard, and all I do is make sure that my stuff doesn't appear on your threat intelligence feeds. Um, <clears throat> so that's not that hard to do. And then other, the other thing you want to do is stay quiet, right? Not have a lot of noisy communication that's eventually going to be tracked by some form of IDS or, or other uh, surveillance system. So um, remaining undetected is not that hard. Um, <clears throat> and so we're going to try to remain as covert as possible as we go through this. Uh, not just in terms of command and control, but in actually how do we move through the network and figure out um, what are the assets we want to go after. So Cyril is a 76-year-old um, male, and I want to be very clear here that he is our target. Uh, and as we have already spoken, or I've already spoken about, um, you know, we're not after data here. We may need some data in order to execute our mission, but our mission and our target here is Cyril. Right. He's the dad of the bad prime minister. And I don't know, our government's tasked us to go after this. We don't really ask many questions. Just do our job. Um, he has a medical history of coronary artery disease with congestive heart failure. Probably the reason he's been admitted to the hospital is something going on with his heart. Um, the allergies that he has is latex, penicillin and iodine. He has medications. He's on IV nitro via a smart pump. He's on beta blockers via a smart pump. He's taking uh, aspirin at the moment and he's on anti-inflammatories all while he's in the ICU. In reality of life, if a patient is in the ICU, there's probably a lot more medications that they're going to be on besides this, especially if they're admitted for some form of coronary artery disease <clears throat> and they're in uh, congestive heart failure or advanced congestive heart failure. But to keep this scenario a little bit simple, I reduced the medication list. So for any of you that are clinicians, um, that's the reasoning. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more that, that would be prescribed to this patient. Uh, just as some side things, uh, the patient is obviously in the ICU. CCU going to be connected to a cardiac monitor 24-7. Uh, they are on oxygen. On NRB stands for a uh, non-rebreather. Uh, and they're semi-conscious. They drift in and out of consciousness. Um, they're being kept in a private uh, room. Uh, and there is security. Uh, obviously, this is a person that uh, would be viewed as a high-value target by their government. So there is security at the front, at the doors leading into their room. Um, so... If you're not familiar with all of this from a clinical perspective, that's fine. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it in a moment. Uh, but what I wanna to talk to here is if I were going to be targeting someone, uh, this is the type of information I would try to obtain as best I can. Uh, and there's obviously different ways I could get to that information, whether it's through news reports, um, other types of media, um, you know, so I don't really have to go after uh, hacking the hospital to figure this out. Um, and maybe I would, but ultimately <clears throat> the piece I want to get across to you here is we're going to go after this person, right? We're, we're not here to, to steal their medical record. A um, couple things that you need to know in case you have, don't have a background in this information is we've put the patient on nitro and beta blockers. Um, so just so you kind of know what those are if you don't already, um, nitro is a medication, IV, obviously we're giving it intravenously from a little drip bag hanging at the top of the the pole, um, and it's being done through a smart pump, right? So the actual rate of the dosage, the, the, the dosing of that medication, both the beta blocker and the nitro is being controlled by the smart pump. Um, any of you that are representing healthcare organizations, hospitals are probably very familiar with, with what I'm talking about. Uh, in these cases, the nitro um, is being used to relieve chest pain, right? If you're having some type of cardiac, ongoing cardiac issues, we don't want you to be in pain, so we're gonna get you some nitro. Um, and, uh, you know, the <clears throat> beta blockers are going to hopefully help uh, to ultimately reduce your blood pressure, not get you into a position where you have high blood pressure. Uh, the thing to keep in mind about both of these is they affect your blood pressure. Uh, so you have to be careful on the dosing because you give them too much, we end up doing what's called dumping the patient, right, which is where their blood pressure drops down to a very low level and becomes dangerous for them. The heart can't circulate blood. Because, um, <clears throat> and you have a challenge with uh, perfusion, oxygenating the cells of the body. Okay, so that's kind of the, the medication list, so just so you have some context. So we've talked a little bit about this in the first episode about attack methodology. And from an attacker's perspective, we're, you know, attackers, we don't really use the kill chain. That's a defender thing. Um, but since we're here to kind of get a little bit of, or hopefully more, viewpoint from the attacker, um, you know, this is kind of sort of what at least I and some people I know use as our 
mission methodology or attack methodology. Yeah, most attackers I've talked to and met, they don't really have a written down methodology. They just go with it and they just do it. Um, and they're not really thinking about step one, step two, step three. In this scenario, we're trying to be a little bit more tactical and we have been given the mission of going after a person. So we probably would employ some much more, a little bit more discipline in terms of how we're moving and what we're doing. Uh, and this is probably, if I were going to do this, would use, not that I ever would. Um, <clears throat> but we did this in the first episode. We went through where we need to do. One of the things we talked about is that the most, um, <clears throat> the best chance of you detecting me is when I'm assessing the environment. Now, in the last episode, we assessed the environment externally. We we're trying to figure out what external facing systems you had. What about your firewall, your VPN? How could we mask ourselves or, or violate the rules of the firewall and do some other things to get in? How could we use proxy chains and things like that? Now that we're in the environment, we're going to need to repeat this methodology, right? The next thing we're going to do is figure out um, what intelligence do we need in order to get to our target? Um, how we're going to assess the environment and what can we exploit in that environment? So again, we're repeating this and the more you can do the or, uh, to, to, to catch me when I'm doing my assessment, you're probably not going to catch me when I'm doing intelligence gathering, but when you can, if you have tools and defenses set up to detect me during my assessment phase of my attack, the chances of you thwarting my attack are exponentially higher. The moment I move from assessment to infiltration or exploitation or execution, when I get past assessment, once I know what's in your environment and what I'm going to do with it, your chances of detecting me vastly deteriorate. Um, and the reason for that is that once I've figured out what you have, my goal is going to be to blend into that that environment. I'm going to do whatever I can to stay within the confines of that world. And so whatever tools you use, chances are they're going to have a harder and harder time of detecting me. Now, I can kind of mess all that up if I deploy malware or something else and you're looking for those signatures or the behaviors. Um, but if I'm actually crafting the attack, which was something we would probably do in this scenario is craft the attack, then your chances of detection, again, start to deteriorate. And there's some things you can do. Um, to hopefully gather um, a leg up, if you will. But what you really ultimately want to focus on as a defender, if you're going to try and stop me from carrying out my mission against Cyril here, or anything, is this here, right? You really want to try to have your question to ask yourself is what tools do we have to figure out in the environment what activities are occurring where somebody is assessing the environment? And um, some of it's very obvious and some of it's not. We'll, we'll try to talk to both of those. So we're going to start with intelligence gathering just so that we can um, kind of start from ground zero. Like, how do we find Cyril, right? The problem is that Cyril is somewhere in the hospital, right? And I don't know where, you know, and I don't want to just take everybody out in the hospital. That wouldn't be very nice of me. Um, but I do need to find Cyril. And so how do I find Cyril? So uh, probably the, the and, and there's some other things I need to do besides find Cyril, right? I need to... Um, figure out the make and model of the life support and therapeutic systems. I know he's on a smart pump. He's doing cardiac monitoring, oxygen distribution. He's getting oxygen. So I got to figure some of this out, right? I got to go assess this and figure out what smart pumps do you guys use in that hospital? Um, you know, what is the cardiac monitoring tools that you're using? What's the, what's the monitor of manufacturer, right? And obviously for obvious reasons. Why? Because once I know that, I can figure out their vulnerabilities or other things. Do they use REST APIs? What uh, ports are they using? Do they support SSH or Telnet? What are the things that those pumps and those devices provide me as the attacker as an inroad? Um, and then I need to determine what clinical systems you're using, what clinical management software you have. You know, who's your EMR? Uh, are, what are you using physician order entry? Is it part of a Meditech or Epic system or something else? Um, <clears throat> that you're using, you know, or do you have a third party physician order entry system? Um, and what are you doing at the nurse's station? How are state nurses monitoring in the ICU, CCU specifically, um, this information? You know, what do they, what do they actually um, have eyes on glass? You know, how's this information transmitted to them? And what's the make and model of what they're doing? So those are the kind of things I can, I'm going to be looking for. And I want to do that covertly. Like, obviously, I don't want to be on your network at this point in time, and trying to figure all this out. I may have to, I may have no issue or no, or no, no option to do that, but probably what I'm going to do uh, is go back to open source intelligence, right? If I need to figure out what smart pumps you have, what cardiac monitors you have, um, you know, what EMR you're using, I'm just gonna go open source. I may be inside your network right now, but 
I don't need to do anything in your network at this moment because I'm just gathering intelligence. Um, <clears throat> And so I want to take a little bit of a diversion here. There's a quite a few different ways that we can look for that information, right? We can look for job postings. I can look for press releases that so-and-so hospital has announced a, you know, acquisition or, or, or a vendor announces that so-and-so hospital has decided to purchase their cool new product or whatever. Um, I can maybe get some stuff off social media. Uh, I can see if um, people are on industry forums, like for medical devices. I can go to MedWrench and see if there's any postings on MedWrench. If you guys don't know what MedWrench is, it's a medical, clinical engineering biomed forum where people, when they see things happening in their devices, their medical devices, they're not really sure what to do. They can log into MedWrench and post messages, right? It's kind of like Reddit for medical devices. And you kind of can post and go, hey, I've never seen this before. My smart pump is rebooting every 20 minutes. Anybody ever seen this before? Oh, what smart pump do you have? I have a brawn. Oh, yeah, I've had that too. Uh, I tried to do this. Right, and it seemed to work. Oh, cool, thanks, I'll go do it. So, cool part about MedWrench is totally free. Anybody can join and people just chat on it like it's secure communications, but not. So, what else, so there's a bunch of stuff we can do. And, and um, what I want to do is kind of um, use this case study as a way to illustrate OSI and show you some of the things that, you know, we're not gonna spend a lot of time here because this talk's not really on that, but this is a step and I want to kind of illustrate it a little bit uh, on, you know, Back in World War II, we had the whole saying, loose lips sink ships, right? And it's kind of come full circle now because people are joining different forums and not thinking that, hey, the attackers can be here too. So this actually um, is part of a different presentation that I'm not going to do, but uh, this involves Russia and a, um, a set of attacks they carried off uh, over the past uh, two to three years where they used a tremendous amount of open source intelligence to compromise critical infrastructure sector. Uh, I believe they carried out 1,600 attacks and the attacks were all kind of successful because of open source intelligence. Uh, and what they would do is they would look at literally job postings, press releases, and client testimonials. And based on that information, they were able to figure out what each target that they went after had in their infrastructure and if it was vulnerable, not vulnerable, or if they had a tenant, a zero day that they could use to go after that infrastructure. And so we, Sensato, decided, well, let's see how fast we could go figure out stuff around critical infrastructure. And we decided, let's go see if we wanted to target a water treatment facility. How quickly could we find out anything about a water treatment facility? And could we affect an attack against them based on open source intelligence? And so what we did is we used Bing, uh, we did three Bing searches. We didn't do any exploits, nothing illegal, and we didn't use any fancy tools. We just literally logged into Bing and ran some searches, three of them. And by the third search, we were able to find this consulting firm. We were then able to get to their website, public facing, none of this. We didn't hack anybody. We didn't attack anybody. This is just literally their admin dump from their public facing website. They just didn't secure it correctly. Um, we we thought that these images here that you see were basically images that were being used by the website for graphics and things. But when we started opening them, uh, we realized, no, these are images of the consulting firm actually uh, proud of the work they do. And you can see there's like 35 images here uh, of a water treatment facility system that they set up. Now, you may be thinking, well, big deal. There's a picture of some guy happy that, you know, he's he's got a job and, and doing the right thing for people. The, Issue is here, and this is exactly what Russia did. Uh, Russia took images exactly like this, and they blew them up. And when they blew them up, they had really strong schematics of what's going on. And, and we started to, um, we we had to block out a bunch of stuff because we actually found in these images, there were things that we could use to probably take the next step in compromising, but we don't do those things, so we didn't do that. Um, <clears throat> but this is an example of open source, right? And and we go back to the example we're doing now of trying to go after Cyril in a hospital, you know, you'd be surprised at the things you find um, out there about your hospital, right? Things you may not even know about because your marketing department's involved. Um, we also found other things like project schematics, a whole bunch of other stuff that all had to do with how their, their systems were set up and coordinated. So one way is to get the information we need to figure out what can we go after that's connected to our target uh, is obviously this open source. And I don't think there's anything there that any of you don't know. But again, I want to re-highlight this because it's it's the first step, right? And the more that this is out there, the more you have to think about what's going to be used against you um, if somebody uh, either wants to get into or is in your environment. The other thing you could do is just visit the hospital, 
right? If this, if we were doing this in real world, um, you know, I would just go visit your hospital and walk around. Chances are nobody's going to stop me or I'd pretend that I have a, somebody I'm visiting in the hospital or, you know, I'll just go buy a lab coat and pretend I'm a doctor. Um, you know, so you can just get in the hospital and go look at what's the name of the smart pumps you have or whatever it may be. So not that hard. The other option is just type in the name of your hospital and see what comes up. And this was kind of interesting because when I put together this presentation, um, I found this and I wasn't looking for it, but I guess it was part of a news article and I've kind of tried to, to, to block it out. But if you blow any of these images up, um, these are all actual violations probably of HIPAA, maybe not at number, but they are inadvertent disclosure because we have the PRN, PI, patient ID, MRN, and other details related uh, to patients. Um, and this was part of a news uh, article. Um, so there's stuff out there, right? It's not that hard to do. Um, and I don't know what you really can do about it to protect yourself, but um, hey, this is why attackers kind of um, have the upper hand a lot of times. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with smart pumps and how those things work, these are smart pumps and these are the IV bags that go through the pump and typically are going to be managed by some system. You can manage them directly at bedside or you can manage them remotely. So just for those of you that may not be familiar with that stuff, that's what that is. When we talk about smart pumps, they'll come into play a little later. Okay, so we, um, we, we kind of have done our open source. We now have to go figure out where is uh, Cyril, right? We, we figured out a little bit about the smart pumps. We've used uh, open source intelligence to figure out what cardiac monitoring tools this hospital uses. We have a variety of ways to do it. We've gotten that. We now need to determine what devices are actually connected to our patient. And, and by that, I mean what specific device, right? If we're going to target an attack against somebody, Again, we don't want to go out and target 20, 30, 100 people that are all connected to smart pumps in a hospital. We want to go after one person. Now, I should say, just to from an attacker's audacity perspective, if I was doing this for real, I probably would wonder, should I go after two, three, 100 people all at one time? Why? Because then it looks more like an anomaly, or it may take more time for somebody to figure out that, hey, this was an attack versus an anomaly that spread through the hospital. So I'd have to play with that idea if I was really doing this, right? So I'm just bringing that up because that is a question that if we were all working together, we would have to kind of brainstorm and figure out how do we want this attack to go? Do we just go after this one person? Well, that could look very suspicious if we're trying to stay covert, or do we go after a bunch of people and try to hide uh, that one person's attack in, in the sea of everybody being attacked? But in this case, we're gonna say, we're just gonna go after that one person, and we need to know what specific device is connected to them. In order to do that, we've got to get the patient ID and the MRN. Um, and there's a bunch of ways we can do that, right? We can do that by going after the ADT system and figuring out where they've been admitted to or um, you know, where they've been transferred to from the ED if they came in through the ED or something like that. We can try looking at EMPI if that's deployed in the hospital and the, major, um, the uh, <clears throat> master patient index and their master patient ID and things like that. We can certainly go after the EMR. Chances are that the CPOE system there would have connectivity to the devices at this day and age, or hopefully. Um, we could go through the nurse's station maybe and see if they're monitoring. Um, we could look at interoperability systems that are managing HL7 uh, communication or FLIR or, some, or FIRE or something like that and determine if we can go that route. The one system that if I were doing this for real that I probably would go after first, frankly, is RCM. Uh, the revenue cycle management, the financial system. And the reason for that is that I found in doing assessments and pen testing and other things that those systems are not usually as locked down as you would think. Uh, a lot of people focus on locking down their clinical systems, which is good, uh, but a lot of times the RCM systems are not as locked down. The other piece of this is RCM systems very often in this day and age are outsourced to third parties. And with that, we find that uh, often um, <clears throat> That is a, a big challenge, right? Because you're not now securing that system. You're transmitting data to a third party and you're hoping they're securing that environment. Uh, if we go back to that Russia example I just gave, uh, many times Russia, what they did in those example of those attacks that they carried out against infrastructure, um, they went after the supply chain and then pivoted. Um, so in this case, chances are if we wanted to do this and I found out the hospital had a third party RCM, I would go after the partner and then get the information I need from Cyril um, and keep myself even more covert and then come after the, the hospital environment once I have that information I need. So a variety of different ways to do that. In phase one, 
Um, what we're trying to do here is identify ports or portals, right? Because portals usually indicate some kind of application background infrastructure. So your EMR may be using a portal from the desktop to log in. Maybe you have a desktop app. Chances are a lot of you today are moving to web-based uh, EMRs or CM, uh, CPOE systems or clinical nursing documentation or pharmacy systems or things of that nature. Um, so, and most of those are going to transmit on port 443. So I'm going to probably look at what do you have in your environment that's open on port 443 or similar? Um, <clears throat> I may be looking for databases, right? I got 1433 here. It's indicative of SQL, but other, other databases also have standard ports. So I may be looking for, do you have any ports open on systems that I'm looking at um, and, and trying to determine, do they have databases? Again, I'm just trying to figure out some system that can tell me what specifically Cyril is connected to. Uh, and then eventually I'm going to try to identify operating system signatures. I don't really need to, but I, it, it probably would help me as I try to carry this attack out a little bit more down the road. So that's phase one. So let me just get kind of a lay of the land. Uh, and this is, again, this is where I'm doing my vulnerability assessment, right? This is your best chance to find me uh, because I'm probably out there poking and touching a bunch of different things. And so this is the moment that uh, two things, this is the moment your best chance of finding me. What's interesting to me, what's funny to me, and literally, haha, -ha, kind of funny, is this is also the biggest moment that defenders rationalize, right? Like if, if you get an alert telling you that somebody is pinging something or there's a port scan done or an address scan done, you would be surprised how many people rationalize that event, right? And it's like, oh, it's no big deal. Or, oh, I don't know why I would do that. And yet this is the very moment in time would you have your best chance of catching me? What's funny is when you figure out that I've deployed, I don't know, Metasploit in your environment and you get alerts telling you Metasploit is present, you take it really serious, right? But it's almost like you gotta get to that point as a defender where there is definitive proof that somebody has deployed something in your environment that is in a complete indication that yeah, there's an attacker here because nobody else would be using Metasploit versus, hey, the earliest moment in time for you to figure out somebody's doing something or some system is doing something they shouldn't be doing is at the vulnerability assessment stage. Sorry to harp on that, but it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it is literally kind of funny if you think about it, it's ironic, I guess. Phase two, once we get past phase one, is we need to figure out network traffic, right? I need to figure out how are these pumps and some of the other infrastructure in environment communicating <coughs> with other pieces of your environment. Now, I have a few different ways I can do that, but a lot of them are noisy. So the easiest way typically is to go after your switches and your network appliances. Here's the interesting part of that. Most network appliances are typically not kept up to date in terms of security. Um, and also we find often when we do these kind of pen tests, internal pen tests, is that often the switch, the network infrastructure very often has um, poor security controls, right? And 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 in a variety of different ways, and I won't go into them all here. What I will tell you, I'll give you a hint of something is, a lot of people, you guys do internal pen tests, and the pen testers, and again, this is a good way for you to think about, is my pen tester thinking about this from an attacker's perspective or an ethical hacking perspective? The pen testers typically are gonna come in and try to pivot and get to the domain controller. Yeah, that's cool. And yeah, that happens, but, very rare have I seen pen testers come in and go after your switches, right? And actually compromise your switch. And in fact, I very rarely hear defenders ask for a pen tester to go try to get to my network infrastructure, right? See if you can get to that. Now, as an attacker, I will tell you, if I had to choose between your domain controller and your switch, I would rather go after your switch, especially in this type of a target of attack, because I need to see your messaging. And once I have your messaging, I could probably set up some port forwarding and do some other cool stuff for you. And at that point, I'm going to see everything anyway, right? And, and chance, unless you have like everything encrypted, but even then there's some other things we could play with that, that may not, may not be an issue with the encryption. But in any case, switch compromises as, uh, as part of this attack is our second phase. Hopefully a takeaway for you guys is, okay, you know, how, how locked down are our switches? When's the last time we did an audit of all of our network infrastructure? Have we held the network admins accountable for security, right? And, and if so, how well? Uh, how old is our network infrastructure? You know, is it over three or four years old, five years old? You know, is it end of life? Because we always talk about end of life servers. But what about end of life network infrastructure? So stuff to think about. So how do I do this, right? Um, 
what I want to do in this situation, and this is kind of where the question comes up, well, how do you do that and not get caught and how not to get noisy, right? How do we go from me doing this and nobody paying attention to me to you find out I've deployed Metasploit? Like right? that's a big jump. Like, hey, I'm looking for ports and doing port scans and address scans, nobody sees me. All of a sudden I deploy Metasploit and everybody's like, oh my gosh, we got a big problem. So how do I do the first piece of this and not get caught? And frankly, by the time you figure out I got Metasploit in the environment, the, probably the next thing you're gonna figure out is I've been around for a while, right? It's not like it gets deployed two seconds later, you're like, ooh, Metasploit. Um, <clears throat> maybe, I don't know. In any case, this here is how I do it, right? That's just Python code. And basically this is just the ability to go out and run Python um, in the environment and do a port scan. So some of you may be going, well, use Nmap. I could use Nmap, but the problem with Nmap is controlling Nmap. It's kind of kind of mind of his own. I could write some Nmap scripts, but if I write some Python like this, I can put in timing variables, right? I'll do like a little clock or something. And the reason I want to do timing variables in this code as an attacker, if I'm going into your environment, is because I don't want you to look for certain behavior. Right? I don't want to trigger that port scan. The way a port scan or address scan alert happens is I do X amount of inquiries over Y period of time. And so you have something out there in your environment that says, hey, if somebody talks to X amount of ports over this period of time, raise a port scan alert. So what I need to do as the attacker is figure out how to play with that time. Right? Figure out like, okay, I've got all day, all week. Maybe I do a port scan of one system every 20 seconds. right? um and 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 play around with that timing variable and and that's easier for me to do as the attacker when i'm using um something like uh python uh, you may say well what if python is not loaded and you got to a system and there is no python well, either i load python on your system because you're not doing file integrity monitoring or you don't have a baseline uh sys uh, uh bill of materials uh, or i go some other route you see or i can also use powershell so what you see here on the screen is blue box is actually the output of a PowerShell script. So if you have PowerShell enabled on desktops or servers or wherever I've gotten to, um, I can just run a PowerShell script and that will give me uh, the ability to do port scan and I can control timing, right? So that's ultimately my goal, right? Is I'm gonna scan your environment or I'm gonna do asset discovery or find where serial is and kind of figure out what ports are available for me or what I can do and where, where I can go. Um, I need to not have a signature or known behavior. I got to try to customize it to the environment so that it blends into what you guys do. Maybe it looks like Landsweeper or something. I've got to control the timing so it doesn't trip alarms and mess with behavioral analysis. Uh, I need to mimic, like I said, legitimate tools and I need to use your infrastructure against you. And so those are the kind of challenges from the attacker's perspective. Frankly, it's not that hard. Uh, and I think probably everybody on this call would agree that, yeah, if somebody wanted to do these kind of things, they'd be hard to detect, especially if they're taking their time. So um, that's kind of the mechanics behind that piece. Um, I want to talk a little bit about security chains. And again, this kind of came up this morning, so I decided to put this in here because this is also a big reason why attackers are successful. Uh, what you see here on the screen is uh, a SQL injection attack, right? It's not really that big a deal. There's some um, normal SQL, which is this here. Uh, and then there's some SQL, this or statement is added to the, the valid SQL. And then that, as the attacker gives me access to your underlying environment. Now, the thing I want you to think about here is that <clears throat> SQL injections or, or command injection, and this doesn't just happen with SQL injection, any kind of injection attack where we're adding in some form of secondary uh, set of commands, um, there's a big issue here that as an industry, I think we forget. And uh, you know, I played this through with the team member from this morning on my team. And I said, yeah, what's the biggest issue? And whenever I lecture on this stuff, like I'll, I'll ask people with injection attacks, what's the biggest issue? And everybody's like, oh, yeah, well, they got your data. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not really the biggest issue. What's the biggest issue? And the bigger issue is what I would call a security chain, right? Uh, and I'll try to illustrate that, but the end result is this, if I can run, this code here, what you better hope is that I can't run this code. This is also on this, this, this piece here is a SQL statement, it's a stored procedure. And what this allows me to do is execute operating system level commands, right? So this is just basically a DOS directory. And why do I do that? Because if I get back that list of information, I know I now as an attacker have an environment in which I can execute 
uh, directory listings. And if I can just execute directory listings, I can probably execute other commands, right? Other types of uh, DOS or, if, for those of you that aren't as old, command line commands. Um, but here's the thing. The reason this is a bigger issue is um, <clears throat> because of this. Lazy engineers and lazy system administrators. The reason this occurs and that this happens, any injection attack, is because the code has been written in such a way that when the user logs in and makes a request of the system, the backend system is probably running as administrator and they're not running under their security context. So if I log into, let's say, a healthcare system like an EMR and I'm logged in as Jago and Jago has a security role that says, hey, Jago can't just grab data. They have to go through some kind of authentication or authorization. But the engineer who wrote that code hard-coded admin rights for any time somebody makes a request of a certain function, then ultimately you're running as admin. But you won't know that unless you carry out an injection attack. The reason I bring this up is you need to think about this from the attacker's perspective that you may be looking for data being exfiltrated. The attacker is actually looking for opportunity to use an injection attack to get to the underlying operating system and from there continue the attack. And here's the cool part, they don't have to escalate privileges at this point because if they've gotten that far, chances are that either the engineer or the system admin for that system hasn't locked that system down and they're just allowing somebody to run as admin. Um, now, obviously, injection attacks are not the easiest thing to find and they've gotten better over the past couple of three years, but if they exist, and if you have them in your environment, you've got a problem. And one area that we have seen these in is infrastructure, whether it's network infrastructure or clinical infrastructure, meaning medical devices or IoT systems. The reason I know that is because we run a class called Writing Secure Code, and we've run that class with uh, IoT, medical device, and other ISVs. And when we go into the class and we run this exact little slide by them, you can see everybody nodding their head and going, yep, yep, that's what we do. I guess we should go fix that. So there's a good chance most of the software you have, especially if it's anything more than two to three years old, has this situation in it. Maybe you haven't discovered it yet, but there's a good point. So the way you can fix it really quickly is go lock down the security rights of the server that's being run or the software runs on if it's in your environment. All right, or if you have a database system, make sure nobody can run as admin. And if anybody's asking to run as admin, you should be questioning what and why, right? There's, that makes no sense, it's bad. So in both of these situations, they're easy things to, to do and not have to go through this like brute force attack and all these other things to kind of get, get into the environment. So at this point, based on the different things we've talked about, we've got the patient ID and MRN, whether it was through open source or through an actual uh, breach of one of the different types of systems or uh, network compromise or something like that. <clears throat> we now need to figure out how do, we, how do we compromise the health of the patient? Right. How do we go do what we came here to do? Because we're, we're not trying to steal data after all. Um, and we also need to be cognizant that we're probably only going to get one chance at this. So we need to do something that is ultimately going to be a, a real high return on investment type of attack. Right. And we want it to be very quick, um, meaning we want the output of the attack to happen very quickly. We want the actual attack to occur very quickly. So this is the, the, call, the best definition of violent, high velocity, high violent attack that I can ever think of. So. Here's a few ways we could do it, or some of you may be already thinking about how would you carry this out, which is cool if you are. Um, and if you have a different way of doing this than I'm presenting here, would love to hear your ideas. Uh, on the HL7 side, yes, some of you are gonna say, well, let's infect HL7. And we could, right? This is a snippet of HL7. Um, we could go after you know some of the information that's being presented or transmitted back and forth on HL7. A lot of HL7 is not encrypted. Uh, and even if it is, we could probably do something like this, get to the interface engine um, and then mess with that interface engine and, um, you know, mess with the information that's being sent around the network. Um, so there's a couple of options there at HL7. Uh, is this the way we would carry out this attack? I don't know, right? It depends on uh, how frequently we're seeing HL7 for that, client, uh, for that patient that we're after. We would be wondering whether or not the medical devices themselves will respond to HL7. Uh, what, what is the HL7 pathway, right? That's what we need to figure out. So we probably could, um, but there might be some other things that we would look to. The other option, one other vector that a lot of people bring up in, in this when we're talking about medical devices is DICOM. Uh, this certainly still works, right? This has been around for quite some time. 
um, and it's still a really good good vector to do. And this might be one that we would actually employ in this situation, um, where somebody you know pretends that hey, I went to see my doctor, now I'm coming to see a doctor at this hospital. My doctor gave me some images. Uh, now whether it's a CD or USB or whatever, there's a chance that this could work. Uh, many of you are going to say, well, we've locked that down, but there's chances are unless you've really locked it down that you have some some machine out there somewhere where somebody can import uh, images from a patient giving them a USB. Um, and so, and if you don't, chances are they'll call the help desk and the help desk will unlock the machine or do something to help out the nurse to get the information in the system. So this is a very valid vector. Um, but again, it takes time and a lot of logistics. We're already in the network um, in the environment in this scenario. So I don't know if we really want to go now and, and wait for somebody to get a USB there. And then what if they can't import the images and how long is that going to take? Um, so, you know, probably not going to go down this path, but we could, it's something to think about. So I want to just remind you of the target profile, right? We've kind of covered this. The big things here uh, are the nitro, the smart pumps, uh, cardiac monitoring, and O2. Right, those are kind of the big things that we're looking at if we're going to do something to deteriorate or dump our patient. Um, you know, we could go after the allergies, but you know, I don't know. Are they going to give the guy cell shellfish, or why would they be prescribing something like ampicillin? I don't know. It's too too hit or miss. Like we need something to really definitively carry out our mission. But could you attack allergies? Sure, you could do that through HL7, direct compromise of the EMR. Uh, or some other vector, right? Interface management engine, going through that, health information exchange, something of that nature. Um, but we're going to focus on these things. So what we're going to do from a tactical perspective is we're going to go after the smart pump. Now, this smart pump that you see on the screen here uh, is no longer on the market. I purposely chose that. I did not want to pick a smart pump of any vendor because I don't want to implicate or suggest that any one vendor has an issue or is, is, would be vulnerable to what we're talking about. This smart pump, by the way, that is on the screen actually was vulnerable uh, and could easily be used in these type of attacks. Uh, and that's why they're no longer on the market. Um, <clears throat> we also would go after the oxygen distribution system. That's another tactical option for us. For those of you that don't know how oxygen distribution works in hospitals, there is an entire infrastructure related to oxygen distribution. Um, so we will talk a little bit more about that, um, but we would probably consider that as well. Um, and then ultimately the cardiac monitor, that's a problem for us. Now, some of you are going to say, Hey, you know, cardiac monitor doesn't, doesn't, um, you know, how, what, what could you do with that? That's not distributing medication. That's not doing anything. No, but it's a problem for us as the attacker. And I'll explain why in a moment. So let's go into each of these and see what we would do. So on the smart pump, um, we would gain access one of a few ways, right? Either we're going to go through an API. There's a lot of um, uh, smart pumps on the market today that do expose APIs and provide APIs. They're pretty good. They're engineered pretty good, but it's software. Uh, we might be able to go directly against it, uh, depending on how it's connected. They're probably going to be through a wireless interface. Um, so there's a chance we might be able to do something along those lines. Um, and they're also sometimes remotely controlled. The API is there to allow third-party apps to control it. So maybe we go down that path of going to the uh, smart pump through a trusted source, right? We go through the EMR, we go through the nursing station software or something like that. So what we want to do here is once we've controlled, once we've accessed that, and once we've actually gotten to that smart pump, uh, the next piece of this is going to be that we need to increase the dosage of the nitro and the beta blockers, right? And we're going to do something called dumping the patient. Uh, when we dump the patient, what's going to happen is their blood pressure is going to tank, right? So when you give uh, one of the clinical things you have to keep in mind, if I'm giving you nitro, your blood pressure has to be above 100. And every time I give you that, I want to make sure your blood pressure is above 100. Um, so if, um, if I have the ability to quickly give you a bunch of nitro, uh, and then on top of that, beta blockers, your blood pressure is going to drop really, really fast. Um, that is going to lead to something called cardiogenic shock, and that's going to lead to hypoxia. Hypoxia just means lack of oxygens in the cells or lack of perfusion or adequate perfusion by the cells. In any case, you're in a lot of trouble at this point, um, and you need interventions very quickly. Now, um, one of the things that could help you is you're still on oxygen, so that might buy you some time. Right, so I need to figure that out. I need to figure out how am I gonna deal with you being on oxygen. Um, I, I need to get you off oxygen and dump your system for about four to six minutes straight. 
right? And once that happens, chances are you coming back are very, very low. Um, so we got to get to this oxygen distribution system. And once we get to that, we need to take control of that distribution system, um, target you as the patient. Now, here's where we get back into this dilemma of what do we do? If, if we need to get you ultimately, and we can't just singly target your system, your oxygen, your, your oxygen cannula, or your oxygen uh, regulator, um, then, and some of the older systems, you can't do that. Some of the newer systems, you can, but we may have to take the entire oxygen distribution system offline. And again, we go back to the attacker's audacity. Some of you may say, well, that would be horrible. You're going to affect everybody in the hospital. Yeah, you're right. Exactly right. Right. And it, depending on the mission and who the attacker is and what they're trying to do, and if we're talking cyber terrorists, then maybe that's what would happen. Right. So, again, as I mentioned in the earlier, this isn't for everybody. Um, there is a fail safe in most of these systems. But unfortunately, a lot of these systems, that fail safe can also be compromised. So, if we move fast enough and quick enough, we could take the oxygen distribution system offline. Since most of you aren't familiar with this, this is what the, they look like. Um, and the areas that are a concern for me uh, as a attacker and you as a defender are probably these systems here, right? Is that we're seeing more and more of these oxygen distribution facility management systems um, that are you know, remotely controlled, whether it's through a desktop, laptop, or even we're seeing some now with, with mobile devices where, where facilities or whoever manages your oxygen can manage these things um, remotely and, and deal with alerts and other things of that nature. Um, and then you can see, obviously, it all eventually goes down. We have our oxygen flow meter, um, and, and we can try to compromise that, right? Um, so um, just what we would have to think about, right? And then the last piece is this monitor. And as we mentioned, the monitor, you know, isn't really doing anything to the patient. It's doing what? It's reporting on the patient. So the reason we would want to go after this is because of the telemetry that it sends to the nurse's station. So we want to make sure that we intercept that telemetry so that when the nurse's station is looking at this stuff on their desktop, they are able to see normal, right? Want to say that, hey, the patient is at 80 pulse they have normal sinus rhythm, meaning their heart rate or their 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 heart uh, electrical activity. Um, we want to keep their oxygenation at 98. How much oxygen are they getting? And we want to get their blood pressure about 160 over 120. And this is the thing to keep in mind. The nurse looking at their desktop or their laptop or anybody walking by the room and glancing at this is going to see somebody who's completely normal. But what did we do in the last situation? We've cut off their oxygen. We've pumped in a bunch of nitro and beta blockers, and we've dumped the patient. Now, some of you may be saying, well, this is a little far-fetched. Actually, not so much. Um, this is typically telemetry is usually done over APIs or sockets. We can easily do a Python program to deal with that. But here's the thing I want you to know. The program, this, this thing here, where everything looks normal, even though it's not, goes all the way back to Stuxnet. So Stuxnet operated in this fashion. When it was deployed to the nuclear Iranian facility, Everybody at the console saw normal. Everything was maintained normal, even though the, uh, the centrifuges were going crazy and way out of normal operating ranges. Nobody knew that because the attackers actually intercepted the telemetry and presented normal numbers to everybody monitoring the centrifuges. And that's why they never took action until they actually exploded. So all we're doing here is taking a playbook out of Stuxnet and making sure that our telemetry to the nurse's station appears normal, even though we've already dumped the patient. And we've got four to six minutes, which brings us to the next issue. We've got to get everybody to leave this patient alone for four to six minutes. But we got all these people walking around. We got like, if this is our patient room, we got two security people that are hanging out. Maybe they're going to hear the person gasp or they're going to see something happening that's not normal and they're going to alert a clinician. We don't really want that if we're going to be successful in our mission. So what do we need to do on top of everything we've already done? Well, if we're really carrying this out as a real mission, probably the next thing we would do is go after the fire alarm system and set off the fire alarms. Why? Because everybody's heads lift up. Everybody, for some reason, walks along the hallways trying to figure out what's going on. And people are going to move to kind of see, is it real? Is it not real? It doesn't have to be real, right? We can even say this is just a drill kind of thing. And yet all we're looking for is to get people not focused on the nurses' stations, but focused on the actual uh, distraction, right? So that's why we would do that. 
And so ultimately, probably if we went through with this and we took our time, uh, we would probably be pretty successful at this. So lessons learned real quick. Uh, your best chance of, of thwarting is always going to be the vulnerability assessment, right? That does not mean you should not protect across the rest of the attack methodology or the kill chain. You should certainly be looking for indicators along all of those vectors. But if you have limited funds or economics, focus on really, really early detection and don't rationalize those things. One of the sad things we do see, and I mentioned it a little of this, is those of you that have put in infrastructures that alert you early, but then you rationalize from a secure, uh, human perspective and, and you don't listen to what, what the systems are telling you. A um, bunch of other things, right? Attacker's perspective can be highly audacious and typically a very different viewpoint than the defenders. And, and I don't know where you guys are on this, but uh, it, it can be off ultimately a very different viewpoint. Uh, the protection of the data is not the same as protection of human life. Very different mindset, how you respond to these situations, very differently. And one thing hopefully you'll take away from this, how would you respond if this were to occur to you? Who would you call? What protocols do you have in place? What is your immediate you know, response to this type of stuff? Um, you know, one thing I try to always get through to people is professional attackers do have your tools. They can buy the same stuff you guys buy, right? They can go buy CrowdStrike, they can buy whatever. And um, when they buy it, they have the ability to reverse engineer it. And that's, that's a problem because that's one of the key ways they understand how to get around it. Obviously not your script kiddies and, and, you know, your junior level attackers, but people that are really looking to do harm, they're going to be patient about it and have the resources to do that. Um, your ability to respond to any life threat is going to be measured in minutes. It's why we say that real incident response, tactical incident response, should be able to respond within 14 minutes or less, right? You don't have a lot of time, especially if the attack has already occurred and you have patients that are dumping or, or, or deteriorating, right? So very, or any human life. We've been talking about a patient. We could take these lessons and apply them to other, other critical infrastructure sectors uh, and still the same lessons apply. Um, from us as a company, there's a bunch of stuff we do that hopefully you'll consider. We have a medical device security program called MDCOP that addresses a lot of this stuff or all of it. We have a medical device field guide that you can get for free if you're looking to deploy a, a robust medical device security program. We do have a full program on how to do tactical incident response. Uh, we, we've done it before. It's a pretty depth, in-depth program and really goes into how to address all of the different things we spoke about in this class. We do have obviously a security operations planner called the CTOC, which is focused on um, really trying to prevent and, and, and help you deal with uh, critical responses from a cybersecurity perspective. I've already mentioned we do a ton of tabletops. And one of the most powerful ways to figure out if somebody's in your environment early is honeypots. And we do have pretty cool honeypots. So if there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. In the meantime, I don't know if there are questions for, for, for this event or this episode. Happy to take them here. Uh, or you're always welcome to email me directly at john.gomez at sensato.co. Um, or uh, one thing we would ask is when you, when this terminates, there'll be a survey. If you could fill that out, let us know how we're doing. You know, we really are hoping that this makes a difference, right? And it involves everybody's skill, including our own. We're looking to learn from this. We learn when we have to put this stuff together and, 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 and hold these events. So hopefully you're getting something out of them. If there's other things you'd like us to talk about or topics, you reach out. We want to keep this going as an ongoing community. Uh, and if any of you want to present on a topic, please let us know that. Uh, we've got well over 100, uh, 120 people that are part of this community now and, and attending these programs. So I'm sure people would love to hear from you and not always have to hear from me. Um, so with that, uh, Laura, I don't know if we have any questions, but um, that's kind of all we have for you guys today. We don't have any questions at this time. Great. Um, all right. Well, like I said, if there's anything we can do for you, please reach out. Uh, with that, hope you guys have a great week and uh, we will look forward to talking to you at the next event. Thank you.